this morning. Yes. It is so good to see your smiling faces. So together, let's stand as we join our voices in praise, declaring that nothing is impossible with our God. Yes. Okay, so we're encouraged in the word. In Revelation 12, 11, it talks about overcoming him by the word, by the, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I'll get it, I'll get it, thank you. Okay, so along that, do you wanna hear a good testimony? Thank you, one person. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, okay. so if you are with me reading through the Bible in a year, we were in Joshua this morning. And this is Joshua's testimony as he's just about to leave and go to heaven. He says this in chapter 23. Behold, this day I am going the way of the earth, and you will know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. That's our God. That's our God. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that just as you were faithful then, you are faithful now. We are so grateful to be your children. Lord, today, will you help us worship you as you are due? Because you are amazing. Lord, we want to lift up Lisa and Sean and Mark and Jen, Jake, Kathy, 
and many needs. Lord, you, you know, <laughs> you know, and you see and you care and you wanna comfort. We thank you, Lord, that you are with, right in the middle of whatever we're going. And today, Father, we very intentionally wanna thank you and be filled with gratitude for what you have done for us. Lord, would you please, this week, give us a chance to share that with somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Good to have you here. If you happen to be visiting with us today, hi, I'm Pastor Robin. I'm Pastor Mike's assistant. Great to have you. If you are joining us online, great big warm welcome to you. We love that you're with us. Um, it's kind of fun hearing where people are listening from. So you can always throw that in the comments of whatever place you're listening to us in. We'd love to know. Um, but yeah, if you're visiting with us, we would love for you to check out the website, realchurch.org. There's a whole lot of great information there. One of them is our connect button. You can scan it. It'll come up right here. If you would like the QR code, you can do that. It'll come, I promise. Or you can go into there. Isn't that cool? You can go into behind the seat pockets. There's a insert there that has a bunch of these QR codes on there too. And you can get prayer. You can connect with us. You can find out all kinds of information. So I want to encourage you to head on over to the website because um, anything you see, all of the stuff that was going through the trons beforehand, you don't have to worry about missing all those details because all of it is containerized there. Or you can check out our app, or you could call the office. I mean, any way that we can help, we would love to do that. So, Maranatha, will you join me? Let's give our visitors a really warm welcome. Okay. Also, Terry Hall, thank you very much for sending in the super cool picture. I know I saw you in your beautiful long hair earlier. There she is. Um, isn't that fun? Kind of makes you want to go to Pacific Beach, Georgia. Is that Georgia or California? California. Okay, well, it's pretty. I love it. Isn't that great? Anyway, so thank you for sending that in. And if you would like to have your cool picture featured on our bulletin, please shoot it in to communications at realchurch.org. We would love to put you in the queue because it's kind of fun to see where you guys are going, what you think is cool. So, yeah, we've got quite a queue now of all kinds of really cool things. So. Um, thanks again for sending that in. Um, I want to share with you, you noticed last week, we started with a video of a volunteer. We are highlighting all of us. So this week, take a look at Terry Walgrave. I'm Terry Walgrave, and I'm doing some painting. And today, I'm, I learned how to put the holes in these so we can stick them up on posts. And so how long have you been serving down here? Four months, maybe? Everyone's very friendly. And Jane is the one that comes here. And I met her quite a few years ago. And then we started going to church. Then I saw her singing up on stage. So I went and saw her. And we kind of rekindled our little friendship. And she said, why don't you come and paint? And I'm like, that's right up my alley. So here I am. Awesome. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. I know. Thank you. So great to have you plugged in, Terry. And I loved her connection with Jane. So Jane, that was very cool. And the truth is, we couldn't do this without you. It just takes all of us. So thank you for doing that. You will notice that Terry was in the shop, right? Okay, we have a great big open house today at the shop. We're highlighting all of the work that they do out there. Today's the day, right after church, 11.30 to 1.30, we're having an open house. There's gonna be food and all kinds of fun things that you can check out and find out what they're doing. And there's gonna be food. And then there's gonna be all kinds of, you can check out the CNC machine, you can check out the laser, and there's gonna be food. Anyway. So check that out. We want to have you come out. They are doing a lot of wonderful stuff out there. And so it'd be fun to 
heavy explore with us. Also, speaking of the guys out at the shop, they're doing the hang around at uh, Thursday nights, and that starts, let me make sure I get it right, they are going to be starting an eight-week class on May 2nd, and you might remember when um, Carl Anderson came and spoke here at church, and he's got this great master class called Love Speaks on learning to hear the voice of God. The guys are going to be doing an eight-week session of him out there right before the hangout, so come on, do the class. Stay for the hangout and the dinner. Get to know the guys. You're going to have a great old time. So, also, you will have probably noticed that the big trailer is in the back. That heralds the fact that our missions garage sale is coming up soon. So we would encourage you to bring your stuff and put it in there if you could. This year they're not doing like large furniture. Sorry about that but um, all kinds of other stuff. So please bring it, and that's gonna be on uh, Friday and Saturday, May 3rd and 4th. So gently used items, uh, make sure I give you all the details. You know what, I'm not gonna be able to catch all the details. Where are you gonna find them? On the website, y'all, they're so good, I love it. Okay, parents, kids camp registration is open, um, and that's kids going from third grade to seventh grade. It is a wonderful time for our kids. Hits all four quadrants of their growth, so check out that information. National Day of Prayer is May 2nd, and it's uh, the first Thursday in May every month. Exactly. It is a wonderful happening, and it's at the American Legion here in Forest Lake, and it's at noon, So, and it only goes over the lunch hour. Please come. Um, if you're not able to make it, please pray where you're at, because, yes, our nation is blessed when we pray. Blessing of the Bikes is coming. Woo! That is going to be awesome. So please mark your calendars, and um, we would love to have your help volunteering that day, whether it's, you know, a half hour all the way to whatever it is you can do. And there's a variety of different things. So Perry and Michelle, do you mind standing up? Okay, this is Perry and Michelle Ingram. They are free riders, directors, and they know all things Blessing of the Bike. So if you have any questions, who are you going to see? Perry and Michelle, exactly. So... Thank you for standing up. Awesome. So yeah, we're really excited. One of our biggest outreaches of the year. It's super cool to see thousands of motorcycles drive through here, get blessed. It's really cool. So with that, let's listen to Pastor Mike at Breaking Stereotypes. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes. And uh, I have to admit, I just got this uh, beautiful little mug from Robert and Anya Johnson. I will read it to you if you can, can, in case you can't see it. Pastor, warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. Ha, boy, I got that. I'm laughing because it's so true. Anything you say or do, I might use in a sermon. Okay, so for breaking stereotypes. Again, friends, I want to remind us all that these quotes are people making comments about American lifestyle, the foundation of this country. It, it should just be etched in our memory. It should light a fire and ignite us. Wake the church up. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Without God, there could be no American form of government. I would love to hear a president step out and say something like that again. Without God, there couldn't be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Recognizing that there's a God is the foundation and the first part of being an American is what he just said. Oh my gosh, I can see people rolling over right now just, ah. Oh. Hey, you know something? Get over it. Thus, the founding fathers saw it, and thus with God's help it will continue to be. What? Thus, the founding fathers saw it. That's what they believed. Something to think about. Amen. Amen. Yeah, no kidding. You know, I don't know about you, but I got to tell you, every week when Pastor Mike reads these quotes of people in our history who were not ashamed to name the name of Christ and understood how important it was in this democracy that we be congruent with our faith and our public service. I just love that. So with that, let's take a couple minutes and greet one another. Say hi to your neighbor. Stick your hand out for a handshake. 
and we'll go into worship. Thank you. Let's be able to just glorify God because he is good. His goodness never stops. His goodness, love is so amazing. Let's worship together, giving him glory and honor because he is good just for who he is. Yes. to scream it out from every mountain top your goodness knows no bounds your goodness never stops your mercy follows me your kindness fills my life your love amazes me because i sing because you are good and i dance because you are good and i shout because you are good you are good to me, to me, to me. Nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans deep only reflect His truth. And in my darkest night, you shine as bright.
circumstances, <laughs> knowing that you are working all things together for good. Yes, may our lives be a testament of thanksgiving, reflecting your grace and mercy to those around us. Yes, we surrender our lives to you trusting in your perfect plan. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up there and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. You've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Yes, get up. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. <laughs>
you continue to work in us bring us life to every area that feels dry and burden help us to trust trust in your process knowing that you make all things new may the truth we have declared in this song resonate deeply in our hearts and guide us as we walk with you we surrender our lives to you lord and ask for your will to be done in and through us. And may your name be glorified in all that we do. So there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better The song before that, though, we they say God, is, he's the God of the mountain, he's also the God of the valley. And, and I was thinking about some people going through an extreme difficult time. I want you to be encouraged because God is there too. It, it's not like, I think sometimes when we go through really difficult times, we, we say, well, God's left me, he's abandoned me, he's forgotten about me. Corey Ten Boom tells a story when she was a Holocaust prisoner, her and her sister. They were often worshiping God, praising him, and all the other, you know, residents, captives, would, would start to make fun of her and her sister, saying, how can you still worship and believe in God? When you're covered in lice, we're mistreated, it's horrible. And her response is meant to inspire. She said, there's no pit so deep that my God's not deeper still. Wherever you are, I want you to know that God can meet you there. Amen? It's really funny. I came across a funny study. My son was telling me about it. Get ready to take an offering, okay? <laughs> While I just talk. Um, it's a great story. It's, it's about hope. It's about hope. True study. Looked it up. Verified it. They wanted to see how long a rat could swim before it died. The average was about 15 minutes. The rat could stay swimming, stay afloat for about 15 minutes. And just about the time it was going under, the scientist, the researcher would reach in, grab it, save it, dry it off, literally only let it rest for just a couple minutes. Then they put it back in to see how long it could swim the second time. Do you know how long that rat could swim the second time? 60 hours. 60 hours. That speaks to the power of hope. Because he had nearly drowned after 15 minutes, he could always go just a little more because he had the hope that he was going to be rescued. And he would go 60 hours. I love it. The mercy of the Lord is new each morning. Amen? Our hope is in him. Praise God. You know, this morning is the third Sunday of the month. And, and I want to just challenge you. If you're not on a regular basis giving to missions... Again, above your tithe and your regular giving, I want to challenge you. Be invested in global evangelization. This morning, we're just gonna, I'm just going to highlight Joanne Oftedal. She's been a missionary, and we have supported her basically from almost the beginning of Maranatha start 43 years ago. She's been stationed in the Philippines. She has dedicated her life. You can tell she's not a young woman anymore. Neither am I a young man. Um, you know, her prayer request is that there are more pastors and workers to be raised up. And, and I think 
it, not only is, does she see the need is great, but again, I haven't talked to her, but I think she recognizes that she's going to be leaving the field soon. And she's praying, Lord, would you send laborers? Would you send more pastors to pastor in this community? Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would help us to lift up our eyes and see the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Father, I thank you for so many that are working, serving, doing the work of ministry here at Maranatha. And Father, then it's through our giving to missions that we are able to send out and support the ones that are coming behind her. Father, we ask a blessing for Joanne that her needs would be met and that there would be more pastors, more gospel workers willing to go to the Philippines to spread the good news of your son. Father, for this, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, one more thing, and that is this, this Brenna chick, you know? She's always doing something athletically, you know, whatever else. And um, so she was in a National History Day state competition over the weekend. And I think we got a picture. There he is. She did the um, a project. Her project was the 1970 teacher strike. And she did this. She went on to the second round. She went all the way into the top 10 in the state. Isn't that cool? Brenda, Stan, where are you? You're over here somewhere. Where are you? There you are. Woo! Yeah! Fantastic. You are as smart as your mother. I know it doesn't come from your dad's side. <laughs> we got it, man. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. That is. Praise God. We are continuing where we were last week in this idea that correction reveals character. Correction reveals character. When you are corrected, how you act says a lot about who you are. And if we're going to begin with Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. It says, do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Last week, we began by looking at some examples, and I basically just broke it off into two major parts. The poor response, the scoffers, and in that, we gave an example of Samuel, the prophet, talking to Saul. Saul just did not get it. John the Baptist telling Herod, what you're doing is not right. Herod took his head. Jesus confronting the Pharisees constantly, and they just never got it. In fact, if anything, they got more defensive than ever before. In fact, that's the way the nature of the scoffer. And I have to admit, our human nature, until it gets transformed by the Holy Spirit, we tend to go there first, don't we? And there's where we can see the surrender to Christ, growing in the Lord, we get wiser. We start to see, hmm, those with a great response. I gave you two illustrations. I'm going to give a, a quick report, re, uh, rerun of that and then tell you about where I left off. Um, we looked at just a couple examples. Number one was Nathan and his old prophet gangly finger. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Pointing it in David's face when he told the story uh, uh, when Nathan told the story, David was outraged. How could somebody do that? And Nathan said, you are the man. And David's response was, it is me. I did that. I mean, he had a great response, a great heart. We read in Psalm 51, that psalm that he wrote over that situation where he cried out to God, cast me not away. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Um, Paul confronting Peter. And Peter kind of going, oh, wow. My hypocrisy has escaped my own vision. And then I want to tell a, a story of 
our past district superintendent. Um, I had the privilege of serving as a presbyter and an executive presbyter for like 29 years and worked w with him a lot. Well, one day I was the, um, I spoke at the men's conference up at Lake Geneva, Alexandria, our Assembly of God thing. So all the Assembly of God churches from Minnesota go up to Alexandria, the men do, and they have a men's retreat. And we're up there and, and, and I spoke and <laughs> newsflash, shock, some guys were offended. I know that takes you by surprise. A couple weeks after the event, Brother St. John calls me up and says, hey, Mike, can we talk? Can you come down to the district office? I'm thinking, sure. I go down there. We're sitting there talking. And he says to me, he said, you know, Mike, he says, um, I got this guy that, that called me and, and you know, he was, he was really kind of bothered by some of the things you said. And really, real often, it's not sometimes what I say, but how I say it sometimes. Because sometimes there's an intentionality of a dig to get people's attention. If you're sleeping, you need to get woken up. Amen. By the way, I told them, you know, the 17 people who complained, I said, them are the people I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, he said to me, he said, I told him that I would, I would, I would talk to you. And I said to him, with every bit of respect, but I basically kind of pointed my finger in his face and said, Brother St. John, I'm really surprised by this. You would have never done this when you were a pastor. You would have told that person to go talk to that, if somebody complained about a staff person, you would have told that person to go talk to that staff person. I said, the minute you told this guy you would talk to me, you gave him the impression that I have done something wrong. The minute you said, I will talk to him. And I said, do you believe I did anything wrong? And he goes, no. I said, really, you've wasted your time and mine. And then he said, well, Mike, he said, I thought we were friends. I said, we are, but that's not why you called me down here. Let me tell you something. I use this as an example because he was a wise person. He had a heart for God. He didn't get defensive. When, he, when I pointed that out to him, I said, you gave him the impression I did something wrong. He recognized it right away. He goes, Mike, he said, I'm sorry. He says, you're right. He said, I will call him and tell him to call you personally. I said, good. And I know he won't. <laughs> the next time we saw each other, he said, hey, did that guy ever call you? I said, what do you think? <laughs> I said, no, he didn't. He was either cowardly or he didn't love me enough. So we come to the point now where I need to ask us all a question. What about us? What about us? us. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. Oswald Chambers has a, a devotional, it's, I think it's September 30th, and uh, when I was asking uh, Pastor Robin to look it up and find it for me, I could almost quote the whole thing because I've, I've read it so many times and I like it so much that it was easy to find, correct? Oswald Chambers is talking about this idea. He's using the metaphor of broken bread and poured out wine. Um, this idea of being instruments used by God to be a blessing to others, that he could use us, okay? Um, and it translates really well into sometimes he has to discipline us. He has to tweak your beak. God can never make us whine if we object to the fingers he uses to crush us with. If God would only use his fingers and make me broken bread and poured out wine in a special way. But when he uses someone whom we dislike 
or some set of circumstances to which we said we would never submit and makes those the crushers we object. We must never choose the scene of our own martyrdom. If ever we are going to be made into wine, we will have to be crushed. You cannot drink grapes. Grapes become wine only when they have been squeezed. I wonder what kind of finger and thumb God has been using to squeeze you. And you have been like a marble and have escaped. You are not ripe yet. And if God had squeezed you, the wine would have been remarkably bitter. To be a sacramental personality means that the elements of the natural life are presented by God as they are broken providentially in his service. Keep right with God and let him do what he likes. And you will find that he is producing the kind of bread and wine that will benefit his other children. Bless you. It's really interesting and very, very sad that church discipline just does not exist. It, it, it exists very poorly today. Because if I go after you and tell you, hey, you know what you did? That, that, that was wrong. That was inappropriate. That shouldn't be done. Or I tell you, I don't want you to do it this way. I want you to do it this way. Or staff and your committee or whatever groups you're working in, and somehow there's some tension gets broken there. Your behavior is going to be paramount on how usable and how you're going to continue to grow as a Christian. Over the years, I have seen some incredible, remarkable stories. Their offenses were severe. At times, in fact, quite a few years ago, uh, we had a board member, board member commit adultery. And because it was a high level of leadership, I told him, I want you to apologize to the congregation. Most people, I can just tell you this, most people would have never submitted that. They go, no way. And they would have left and went to another church. This fella, his wife, they agreed together that she agreed to because it was just a very, as you can imagine, tough, tough, difficult situation. But he, he, he's, he gave into it. He got up announced the, the situation, asked for forgiveness, both from his wife, from the congregation, and all that. Went through a restorative program with him. He never left. They stayed. And you know something? Their life became better because of it. Every once in a while, um, there are little discipline situations going on, and you don't know about it. And I, I, I would tell you, I tell you what, there's one that happened kind of recently um, that the person was a wise person because his response was great. It does beg the question, what is our response? Which brings me now to this part that we're going to be in for, I don't know, one, I might finish it today. Probably not. But it begs the question, who receiving and giving constructive criticism? Receiving and giving correction. So, on the receiving end, the question is, well, who can bring the correction? Wouldn't it be great if there were, you know, um, Old Testament prophets running around that, you know, and we all clearly knew they were a prophet? <laughs> it would be really cool, right? Now in the New Testament, there's a lot of people running around claiming to be prophets. I wouldn't listen to one of them. Hello? There are a lot of people running around saying, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet. Do you, okay, a little, little side note. Don't be fooled. Okay, because I know that some of you, you, you spend way too much time on the computer and YouTube and you listen to all this stuff. Oh, there's a prophet this and a prophet this and a prophet this. Shut the thing off. The, the definition of a prophet is not a foreteller. 
but a fourth teller. When you read the scriptures and you talk about the, the prophets, even you know the, the major prophets and the minor prophets, but these guys told of the future this much. What they did this much was proclaim the word of the Lord. Proclaim the word of the Lord. This is what God says. So when you see a pastor, a preacher, preaching the word of God boldly, clearly, you're probably looking at a prophet. Um, Apostles. I didn't plan on going down this road, but I might as well just clear up a lot of people. Oh, I'm an apostle. Shut up. No, you're not. Okay, I mean, people use all this mystical and they're trying to, whatever. golly. The word apostle means sent one. That's what it means. The apostle, sent one. Who are our sent ones today? Missionaries. Not some guy doing, you know, YouTube reports and telling you about, you know, the... Are you, hello, are you with me? Yep. Okay. I went down this little bunny tree and lost my, lost my place. <laughs> no. uh, I just, you know, I, I, over the years I've just come into this, there's so much weird wackadoodle stuff that happens in Pentecostal circles. You know, I am not ashamed of being a Pentecostal, but I'm embarrassed many times by what people do in the name of Pentecostalism. Oh, it's almost like they, they believe that the weirder you are, the bigger trophy you get. And they're going for it. I mean, they're really going for it. They want the biggest trophy they can find. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Oh. Okay. Proverbs 15, 32. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul. But he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. Proverbs 17, 10, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Some people, it doesn't matter. They just don't get it. So, let's ask ourselves the question, this idea of receiving. Who can bring correction to you? Okay, Um, should, should you listen to everybody? Oh my gosh, I hope not. Could you imagine, I tell people all the time, hey, I have people telling me all the time, what I should do, would do, can't do, shouldn't do. Yeah, I, I, if I listened to what everybody told me, I wouldn't say nothing. I would just sit up here and go. And then I'd hear somebody complaining about I smiled too big. So who can bring correction to you? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Obviously, God. Okay? God has the right to do it anytime he wants. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 7. Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? And it says sons here. It means sons and daughters. Okay? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you read on more in that chapter, you go through verses 7 through 11, he talks a lot more about this idea of, hey, your earthly fathers punished you, and you respected them for it. How much more God, because he has the best interest for you, is not limited by the humanity of your earthly father. How much more you should receive that. So obviously God can bring correction or rebuke into our lives. Which begs a question, doesn't it? Do we recognize it? I, I tell you, I, I wish I was a better listener. I wish I was a better observer. Because I think at times God tries to get my attention and I'm just not listening well enough. Now, thankfully, he stays with it so that eventually I do hear it. By then, usually it's gotten pretty loud and pretty, pretty direct. Ouch! It would have been a lot simpler if I'd have listened better earlier. Amen. Amen? 
Sometimes, like Oswald Chambers talking about, God, if you would just do it, I'm good. And we could be the martyr and how wonderful that God intervened and spoke to me. But unfortunately, sometimes he uses people. (laughs) Oswald Chambers went on so far to say, sometimes people we object to. Um... Four things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just kind of a, a real, here's, here's real often what God will use to speak correction into our life, okay? Circumstances. If we are paying attention, circumstances. You know, Pastor Mike, I keep running into this situation. Ah. Have you ever paused long enough to say, God, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to say, are you trying to speak to me? Are you trying to tell me something? Am I dense? Am I not listening? God has a way of correcting us through circumstances. He has a way of correcting us through his word. And the word there, the logos, the Greek word uh, for word, logos means literally the word of God. In, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. You have heard me say often, and I hope you find it to be true in your life as well. I read the Bible, and sometimes it makes me upset. It bothers me. It brings me conviction. I wish it didn't say that. Why? Because it's right and I'm wrong all the time. 100% of the time. Well, Pastor Mike, I believe, well, you know something? If the Bible says something different, then you're wrong. It doesn't matter what you think. Yeah, but I really believe. (laughs) Shut up. It doesn't matter. What does the word say? You know, the Apostle Paul says, not that I've obtained, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the high call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not there yet. Friends, and none of us are. On a regular basis, I would like to think that when you read the word of God, you are corrected. You are inspired to bring a change to your life. You are, um, it it says here, correction, instruction in righteousness, um, doctrine for reproof. It corrects us. The, The word of God does that. If, if you are not on a regular basis spending devotional time in the word of God, then you don't know what I'm talking about. Because the word of God, it goes, ah, you have these aha moments. Which brings me to the next word of God. Okay? God brings correction to us through circumstances, through the word logos, and through the word rhema. The Greek word rhema means the revealed word of God. Um, when God would speak to you, he would say something to you, he'd make it very plain to you and make his will known to you. For you, I can, I can talk about my, my um, call into the ministry. You've heard me share that many, many times. I'm in, the, I'm in this little chapel area. I'm praying. I say, God, everything's going well. I feel like everything's been good, but I, but I feel like I'm missing something. And I realize I've never asked you, what do you want me to do in my life? And I heard God say, I want you to preach the word. That was a rhema word of God, a revealed word of God. Now, you know the rest of the story too. Scared the jeepers out of me, I got up and left. I went back in the next day, opened the door, looked around, nobody's in. I slipped in, I knelt down the same place I did the day before, and I started out my prayer this way. Father, forgive me for walking out on you yesterday. But this is me, Mike Hazeltine. What do you want me to do? And again, the rhema, the revealed word of God, I want you to preach the word. And I start giving all kinds of excuses. Man, they don't do this and nobody treats them well. Everybody doesn't like them. I can't talk in front of people. And I sense God laugh. He said, many others have tried to get out and have failed and so will you. I'm like, that doesn't even sound very kind. I 
I said, you know, they don't make a lot of money. Nobody likes those guys. I gave him a whole list of things. You know, I can't talk in front of people. And he said, Mike, I will take care of your needs. Some people will like you. <laughs> don't worry about not speaking and being able to speak in front of people because I'm really not counting on your ability anyway. I want to speak through you. I mean, and friends, I'm now at, I have more of my life in the rearview mirror than I do the windshield. And I'm just going to tell you this. God has been faithful. Amen. God has been so faithful. Everything he promised me in that, 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 that uh, chapel area, he has fulfilled. I have no complaints. God is faithful. The revealed word of God. Um, I was down in the revival going on down in Brownsville. This was years ago. And I didn't even know there was a revival going on, but I went down there. Man, we're not going to finish this today. Um, but is anybody bothered by that? Okay, good. Um, so I'm down in, in Brownsville going for a pastor's conference, and we're there. And this was at the a time where we were in our other building, where Cub is now. And we were making plans and thoughts about looking to buy property somewhere to build a bigger building. Uh, it was so early in that process, it was amazing. I mean, so just early days. We're just beginning to dream and talk about it as a board and a staff. And, and I'm down in Brownsville. And the, the, one, the next morning from that first day, the next morning, Paul Yangi Cho sends a telegram to the pastor, to the church there. He said, I was up late last night. He said, I, I, and the Lord strongly impressed me. I need to send a message to Brownsville, to you guys. And here's what the message from Paul Yonggi Cho said. He said, there are some of you in the congregation that are contemplating building a new building. God says, build it large. Expand the tent stakes out wide. Now, I know I'm not the only one there that was going through this, but I can tell you this. When he was reading that letter, I was just like, yes, this is God. The revealed, the rhema word of God. That night, I go back to my hotel, and uh, Orlean's not with, um, so I go back to the hotel, and I'm just reading in the scriptures, and I was reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and I came to verse 9, and, and I read this, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When I read that verse, I knew, I mean, it was like the Holy Spirit came into that room and emphasized it and says, Mike, I'm speaking this to you afresh, anew. And I knew it, and I hung on to it. It's just like, it is so true. And I can tell you this, every part of that verse was accurate. It was a wide open door. God was clearly giving direction and saying, go this way. But there are always adversaries. There are always naysayers. There's always people that are going to rain on your parade. Amen? You know, if you in your life at work, every one of us, we go through life and not everybody likes you. Okay, if you think everybody does, you're a narcissist. <laughs> Um, not everybody likes you. It's just, the, it's just the way it is. It doesn't make you a bad person. In fact, it's their fault. No. Um, <laughs> you know, so being a public figure, you know, I, again, I, I catch more than what you all could even imagine. And it's easy to, when you get a negative comment, to really just take it to heart. And it's really hard not to. But I remember being encouraged by somebody who says, you know, Mike, don't concentrate on the 10% who write and say and do and think and believe these things. Why don't you concentrate on the 90% who are for you? So and I want to share that with you too. You know, because this life is filled with all kinds of adversity and people are going to judge the decisions you make. Oh, I would have done this. Well, it wasn't you. It's my decision. You know, I mean, whether it's to go through radiation or not go through radiation. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to buy a house. You're going to sell. You're going to do this. You're going to buy this car or this boat. Or you're going to do... 
There is a myriad of things for people to judge you on, isn't there? Tell them to shut up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kind of on a kick, you know, lately with that word, phrase. So parents with kids in here, I am sorry. You'll have to explain to them. Pastor Mike, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike at realchurch.org. That is my email address. It's true. So God, again, this is not an ex- exhaustive list, but God, who can bring, who, who should we receive correction from? Who can speak into our lives? Who can bring that correction? Well, God can. Through circumstances, through the logos, the word of God, through the rhema, the revealed word of God, but also through people. He, he, can, he can use people. If you're paying attention, he can use people. And I just got to revisit Oswald Chambers' quote. You know, um, God can never make us whine if we object to the fingers he uses to crush us with. If God would only use his own fingers and make me broken bread and poured out wine in a special way. I wonder what kind of finger and thumb God has been using to squeeze you. And you have been like a marble and escaped. You know, that is something that every one of us in this room can contemplate. Amen? Amen. The second group, uh, the second uh, person is our friends. Who has the right to give us correction or to speak something into our life? It's your friends, okay? Um, Probably because of that, Proverbs 12, 26 says, the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. You do have to be careful who truly are your friends. And I can tell you this, over the years, some friendships that I had are no longer because they were going down a path. I don't, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. The set of my life is to go this way. It says in Galatians chapter 2, we read this last week, when Paul was confronting Peter, even Barnabas, that was the shock, even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Every once in a while when people are doing things that are just wrong, they're trying to convince you how right it is, there ought to be a disgust. What you're doing is ungodly. Choose your friends carefully. So why should you listen to your friends? Two reasons. Probably more, but I only got two, so we can get out of here sometime today. Before two o'clock. Why, what's that two? Oh, before two o'clock. It's it's Talladega. (laughs) So right after church, I'm gonna go down to the wood shop and hang around with you all that come down there and and visit with you a little bit. But then at about... one o'clock, I'm out of there, like a race car driver. Okay, two, two, two reasons why you need to listen to your friends. Number one, they know you. And you can almost add in there, too, is they love you. They care for you. They're your friends. They, they know you. I, I love it how people walk up every once in a while, as I alluded to, people tell me stuff. You should, you don't even know me. And sometimes, and this sounds maybe a little braggadocious or arrogant, I don't mean it to sound that way, but I just, it, there's just a reality. You know, pastors try to give advice or else, and I was thinking to myself, until you pastor more than 500 people, you don't have a clue of some of the pressure, the decisions, and the things that you need to do to lead something. They know you. Proverbs chapter 27 you're going to want to underline this. You know, sometimes if you, if you don't bring your Bibles or find a way to underline something, man, these are just, this is a passage of scripture you would want to memorize, especially verse six. But Proverbs chapter 27, verses five and six. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. 
You know, when you, the, usually the greater love you have for somebody, the more direct you can be. And, and it's not always a rebuke. Sometimes it's just a word of advice. Hey, you know, you're, you're probably not aware of this, but I observed the way you treated so-and-so. And, and you're probably not aware of this, but man, you were really rude. You were not thoughtful about that at all. So the deeper the love that you have for that person, the more often you can speak and be that way. You know, when you see somebody that's heading for, they're going 100 miles an hour down the dead end street, and you choose to say nothing, it's because you don't care. You don't care. You care more about what they think about you than about their life. Verse six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. If somebody's always telling you everything's all right, oh, you're wonderful, you're marvelous, um, probably not a real friend. Um, I don't want the staff to tell you stories, but the staff here, they're used to me being kind, but pretty clear, pretty direct. And it's not always you're marvelous, you're doing marvelous. It's usually you are marvelous, but what you, you could do this better. You could do this better. Amen? Amen? I'm trying to look at more, where are some other staff? Nikki, where's Nikki? Oh, she left. <laughs> she must have seen it coming. She sensed it. She's real prophetic that way. Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but many are the kisses of an enemy. That is a great verse to memorize because if you memorize it, it's kind of in there, you're thinking about it. It's, you know, we, we talk about this kind of a concept about a lot smaller issues. Like if you had spinach in your teeth, would you, if I had spinach in my teeth, would you tell me? You know, how long would you wait? <laughs> you know, would you wait until after I get off the platform? And then say, hey, by the way, you know, that whole service, man, you had, you had spinach right in the middle of your teeth. You know, you'd have to find a way to tell me a little sooner. When you love somebody, you want the best for them. You're looking after their best. A, God, B, friends, C, who can bring correction into your life? People who want the best for you. So it's kind of like friends, but it's a different group of people that I've, I've put and included in here because you need to realize these people are there not because they don't like you. And again, I'm not gonna expand on any of them. I'm just gonna mention them. Uh, number one, a mentor. If they're, I said I wasn't gonna do it. Now I'm gonna do it. If you, you know, a mentor in your life. There, there's got to be some people in your life that you aspire to. That you, you look at their life and you go, you know, I want to be better at this. And I see this quality in their life. I want more of that. Well, when E.F. Hutton speaks, you're going to listen. When they speak, you are wanting to learn and glean from their life all the time. Friends, you can learn from everybody both what not to do and what to do. So who has the right to bring correction into your life? People who want the best for you. A mentor, a coach. Young people. Coach tells you to do something, you go, that coach don't know anything. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> There's two people in this comment and you're wrong. The coach, the coach knows. I'm not going to listen to that coach. Yeah, and you'll be a loser. You're going to lose out. The coach has no personal gain except for to make you better. A counselor. A counselor. You know, if you're a counselor in this room, no doubt one of the biggest frustrations you have is People don't listen. Hello? Now, 
when you're raising children, you're a counselor to them. And how many times have you said, they just don't listen? At times, this job is one of the most difficult jobs because you don't listen. Week after week, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, a, a, a counselor. On more than one occasion, and to the counselors out there, maybe you've said this many, a million times too, you know, your life would be truly a lot better if you would just listen to what I'm telling you. Not too long ago, somebody said to me, uh, they're in a difficult situation, they said, so Pastor Mike, what would you do? I, and I said, that is an irrelevant question. They looked at me like, well, what do you mean? What would you do? I go, you can't do what I would do. You don't have the skill set. So the better question is, what do I suggest that you could do? What are some possibilities that you could do? Because to answer the question, what would I do? We're in two totally different realms. Are you with me? And then lastly, a confidant. There are some people in your life that you share things with that you don't share with anybody else. Them people have the right to say something to you. Amen? They're confident. They, they, they are far and few in between. We've all made the mistake of trusting somebody as a confident that wasn't. As soon as they get their beak tweaked, they get whatever, and all of a sudden, oh, you're not gonna believe that. When I was with Pastor Mike, or when I was with, you know, Mike, they're going, when I was with Rob, you know, he said this, this, and this, and this. Lastly, who can bring correction into your life? Spiritual leaders. Hebrews chapter 13. And with this, I'm gonna close. Right after another verse. So I, I meant this one, but you know. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. So if the worship team wants to start coming out on the platform, you feel free to go ahead. Hebrews chapter thir uh, 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Friends, I want you to know that this is not an exhortation for blind obedience. Never are we asked to just believe and go with something somebody says. I would tell you often, search what I'm saying to be true. The Bible teaches us, test everything and hold fast to that which is good. But at the same time, there's got to be a level of submission sometime in your life where you go, I'm trusting God that he's speaking through you, that you see something in my life that I don't see. We balance that tension with spiritual leaders. At some time, they're teaching, they're talking. Well, I just don't agree with that. I'll never forget, there was a woman, it was her first, their first Sunday here. Her husband had come a couple times and she was sitting right over, they were sitting right over there and it was her first time. And I was reading a quote. It was not my own material. I wasn't making fun of this, the, the situation. I was just reading an article that described how 48% of the women in the military cannot throw a grenade far enough to prevent from blowing themselves up. Oh, as soon as she huffed up, stood up, and just marched out. And I was grieved because I thought, there is an example of a person who's not going to learn another thing in their whole life. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. Consider the outcome of their conduct. Just because somebody says they're a pastor does not make them trustworthy. 
One of the best blessings and the benefits of being here for 44 years in this community is you cannot fool this many people this long. Perfect, far, far from it. Called by God, absolutely 100%. And I appreciate your support in that. But you really need to look at this. The proof's in the pudding. Either they're living it or they're not. And those that are living it, listen to. Not blindly, but listen to it. The question you need to really evaluate and look through the, the lens is, are they, are they godly and are they growing? Are they godly and are they growing? Same thing with the friends that you're allowing to speak in your life. Are they godly and are they growing? Amen? Father, there is nothing better than you. Father, every one of us here desires to be perfected by you. We want your finger and thumb to point out, bring correction in our lives. But we're not always good at recognizing your finger and your thumb. We're not always quick to recognize your voice or to see in the set of circumstances that we're in, to see your hand lovingly trying to bring correction or direction. So Father, I, we pray that you would help us to open our eyes unstop our ears. May we have ears to hear. May we have hearts to believe. And Father, may we receive correction as it comes from you, from friends, from people that we know want the best for us, and from spiritual leaders. Father, we thank you for all this in Jesus' name.